excited to tell you about a new digital service offered through Cobb Library's OverDrive collection, Streaming Video. This service is similar to Netflix and Amazon Prime streaming services, except it's free. If you're not familiar with the OverDrive collection, it includes the library's digital content, including ebooks, e audiobooks, and now streaming video. You access this collection through the library website, www.cobbcat.org. Click on the digital downloads link in the collections list and look for the green OverDrive link at the top of the page. There are over 400 movies available in OverDrive to watch on your PC and most mobile devices, including feature films, documentaries, and children's classics. The process is easy and no special software is required. To get started streaming videos from OverDrive, you'll need your library card number and PIN number. Videos can be viewed on almost any PC through an internet browser and on most mobile devices, including Apple, iOS, and Android devices. You just need a compatible device, an updated web browser, and an internet connection to stream your video. Checking out a video is easy. Click play to watch a video in your browser on your PC or download the OverDrive app on your mobile device to add streaming video to your app bookshelf. The checkout time for videos is seven days. After seven days, the video simply disappears. No need to worry about returning movies late unless you want to return it early. If a movie is not available because it's checked out, you can place a hold, just like a book or audiobook. OverDrive will email you when your movie is available. There is a five movie checkout limit for streaming videos. To get a step-by-step -step overview of how to stream videos from OverDrive, you can go to the OverDrive Get Started page. You'll find this resource by clicking on the Digital Downloads link under the Collections list on the library's website. Then click on the red New Users Get Started button. Scroll down the list of help guides until you see the link for streaming videos. You can also come into any branch and a librarian will be glad to show you how the process works. Enjoy watching streaming videos from the OverDrive collection today and don't go away we'll be right back with more of the show. Did you know that Georgia's libraries provide resources for people who are legally blind or physically unable to handle a book? That's right, and Pat Herndon, Director of GLASS, is here to tell us more. Hi, I'm Pat Herndon. I work for Georgia Public Library Services as Director of GLASS. GLASS stands for Georgia Libraries for Accessible Statewide Services. We provide Georgia's access to the National Library Service for the Blind and Physically Handicapped, or NLS's Talking Book and Braille program. It's a program offered to any eligible and enrolled resident in Georgia who needs to have audiobooks or braille because they can't hold a book or turn the pages. Glass is a very important service. We're here to meet the needs of anybody so that all citizens, all residents can be participative. You can stay up on current events. You can talk about the same books your friends are talking about even if you can't hold a book and turn the pages or see the words on the page. You, everyone has the right to read. It's reading for all. This is important. It's our mission and we're here to make reading accessible to everyone who wants to. To get started in the program, a person needs to get an application. The GLASS website has our application online. 
can be filled out. It needs to be then certified that somebody is attesting to the fact that the person filling out the form has a disability of some sort. Um, most disabilities, a librarian can fill it out. So if you're in the presence of a librarian, um, a physician, a service provider, a social worker, a rehabilitation counselor, a physical therapist, an occupational therapist. Anyone can fill one out for any physical disability. That includes vision impairment. No one can sign one off for a family member. So if your brother is a physical therapist, he can't sign it off for you. But any body else can, and like I said, including a librarian, so you could actually carry one into a public library, stand in front of the librarian, and they could sign it. If the impairment is a reading disability, there is a little bit more of a hoop to go through. A physician has to sign off for a reading disability. This includes dyslexia. On the form is the address. It can be mailed back, postage free, to our office in Atlanta where we'll get you enrolled, processed. Within two days of receiving the form, we contact you, talk to you about what type of books you like to read, how many books you want to have on hand. We take it from there. We do the heavy lifting of helping you select your books. The books will be mailed to your home if that's how you prefer or we can inform you on how to do your own downloads and download them onto your own um, flash drive that you can use with one of our digital talking book players. We mail you the talking book player, no cost. Any problems ever happen to it, you can mail it back to us at no cost using the Free Matter for the Blind program. This device is the digital talking book machine. This is the advanced version. It's got a lot of navigation keys. We do have one with a few less keys, but we find most of our patrons prefer this machine. Very rock solid, very well designed. It can be dropped, it can be carried around. It's got a rechargeable battery. For people with low vision, you see there's high contrast in the color of the buttons that you use to turn it on and to play and to adjust the volume. Each button also has tactile um, ridges on it so that you can learn what the machine feels like for the people who truly cannot see. The volume can be adjusted. It can take headphones so you can listen to your book in private. It can take a pillow speaker which we can provide to you for someone who is bedridden. They could just plug this in and listen to the speaker right next to their pillow. It will play flash drives of audiobooks so if you're already used to downloading books from your public library you can actually play mp3 books on this machine as well. And of course it plays our digital books which come in cartridges. The books that are available in our service, they look kind of funny. Um, they come in blue cases that are our mailing cases. They look like a cartridge. They look like a cassette, but they're really a flash drive. And our collection is materials that are very much like what you would find in any public library. Think of our collection as the assistive technology to keep you connected to your public library. We have bestsellers. We have books that appeal to all ages of readers. We have children's books. We've got the full Joni B. Jones all the way up to James Patterson. So we've really got everything. We do have nonfiction books as well. And we have a very well-rounded collection of materials that mimics what's in a public library. In addition to our audio books, we have audio magazines. And in addition to that, we have access to Braille. In Georgia, we do not keep the Braille collection in our state. However, if you're enrolled in the program, you need access to Braille, we'll get you enrolled and signed up. And the state of Utah mails out our Braille to our patrons. Any customer can go to AMLAS, which we're going to rename it. We're going to call it GLASS. We've got a lot of program changes going on just organizationally how our program is set up. But for metropolitan Atlanta, in our central area, right on, on the MARTA line for people that need um, public transit and for people that use paratransit, at the central branch of Atlanta 
Fulton Public Library on the fourth floor is our library right now. It's called AMLAS. If you walk in there, we don't have a huge collection of books there, but we have staff ready to assist you. Books can be downloaded there if you're an enrolled patron. We do have a small selection of books. We have a children's area that has print braille books, which are really neat. It's a braille overlay of a children's picture book, which are some of the most amazing things to see. Not every child that is suffering vision impairment is fully blind. They can still appreciate the color on the page. And better than that is they might be learning braille and adult could sit with them and read along. So that's pretty cool. We also have a computer lab that has assistive technology. We've got screen reader software. We've got magnifiers available, um, the closed circuit TV magnifiers, and everything that can make access to information easier. If people want to find out more information about GLASS, about Georgia's Talking Book and Braille program, you can call us at a statewide 800 number. It's one 800 248 6701. Except for holidays, we work Monday through Saturday, 9 to 5, answering the phone and assisting our patrons. We'll be happy to send you an application or we'll likely direct you to our website, which is www.georgialibraries.org slash G-L-A-S-S. Glass, Georgia Libraries for Accessible Statewide Services. Librarians need to know that although it seems like there's a barrier to service, and librarians hate barriers to service, or the good ones do, there is. We have to, we're able to reproduce our books without regard to copyrights. This is a, provided to us by federal law that we can copy the materials for the needs of the enrolled and eligible patrons. So we do have the enrollment, we have the eligibility statement, but after that, it's so simple. So what I want every librarian in Georgia to know is point any eligible patron to our application, help them fill out that application, and trust that that patron will be able to read after they're enrolled in our service. For more information about GLASS, visit www.georgialibraries.org slash GLASS or call 1-800-248-6701. Welcome back to the Library Show. I'm Beth. And I'm Shannon. Happy New Year, Shannon. Happy New Year, Beth. So Shannon, do you ever make New Year's resolutions? As a matter of fact, I do. And this year, I resolve to learn something new. And how are you going to do that? You know, if you visit your local library, you can find books that teach you how to do new things. Like this book I found that teaches me how to draw. It's called Ed Emberley's Big Purple Drawing Book, Learn to Draw the Ed Emberley Way. This is just one in a series. There's a big green drawing book, a big blue drawing book, and they teach you step by step how to draw. Oh, cool. My resolution is actually for my dog. He is going to learn some dog obedience because this one's called Dog Obedience, Getting Your Pooch Off the Couch and Other Dog Training Tips. Now, he's already a pretty good dog, but I think this could give him some refreshers. And if he does a good job with this one, because he is a good boy, we might even try Dog Tricks or Speaking Dog in the same series. I think my dog could use that book too. <laughs> I have an animal book here. It's called You Are a Lion and Other Fun Yoga Poses. I've always thought that I should learn how to do yoga, and I haven't done it yet, but it's a new year. Yes. And maybe with the help of this book, I can ease into learning yoga with these fun kid yoga animal poses. And I also thought I might try it in story time, too, and we'll see how that goes. Oh, that'll be so much fun. I'll let you know. <laughs> well, I found this book about quilting, because I've always thought that quilting would be cool, but I've never quite figured out how to do it. So I found a book about how to do so. Now, I also found this one called African American Quilting, The Warmth of Tradition. And this one's from the Hattie Gaines Wilson Special Collection, and it talks all about the history of quilting, both in the old world and the new world. And then I also found Eight Hands Round, a quilt alphabet, I'm sorry, a patchwork alphabet, where each letter of the alphabet talks about a different patch or quilting style. So I thought that was pretty cool. So once I learn all about the history, I'll be ready to get started and make one of these. Those look really fun, but if you're unsure about a needle and thread 
What about building with Legos? I found the Lego playbook, Ideas to Bring Your Bricks to Life. Who doesn't love Legos? I love Legos. And I think everyone has some Legos at home. I like to build things out of my own imagination, but sometimes, you know, it might be nice to get an idea or two from a book like this. The library has other Lego books too. This is just the one that I found. So you can check your local library and see what Lego books you can find. Yeah, you might even put some on hold from another library. Yes. Well, back to the needle and thread thing. I found one called Cross Stitch Dinosaurs and Monsters. Now, I already love to cross stitch, but I'm always looking for more inspiration and new designs to stitch. So, at the library I found a couple different ones, but this is the first one I found about dinosaurs because I love dinosaurs. And I would kind of love to fill my house with dinosaurs cross stitched. That looks really cool. Yeah. <laughs> I have one more book that I brought with me. It doesn't show me how to make something, but it does show me how to view the night sky. It's called First Field Guy Night Sky. I think the winter is a good time to go out and stargaze. The colder the weather, the brighter the stars look in the sky. So I have this book that I found that will show me different constellations and whether I'm looking at a star or a planet. So I think I might give that a try, and I even might bring my dog with me. Oh, I love that. I think he would like it. Yeah. Well, speaking of some cold weather, this one is for my mom that I picked out. It's called Fix It and Forget It Kids Cookbook, 50 Favorite Recipes to Make in a Slow Cooker. Now, mom gave me a slow cooker a couple years ago, and I have not made the most of it, and she keeps saying how easy it would be if I just learned what I was doing. So I figured, okay, kids cookbook, that is the place to start, so I can be ready to leave for work, come home, assuming the dog does not make me something because these books, while they do teach you a lot, don't seem to teach much about dog cooking. No. <laughs> yeah. So that I will be ready to have home cooked meals ready for me when I get home. That looks really yummy. I use my slow cooker a lot. Oh cool. I haven't tried that cookbook though, so maybe when you're done with it I'll check it out. Oh good. And then I brought a couple other things too. And one's a CD, one's a DVD, and it's um, about learning Spanish, because that could also be a project for the new year. We have books about it too, but sometimes I think hearing it and seeing it is kind of helpful for me. Yes. So we hope that you'll visit your local Cobb County Public Library, check out a book about learning something new, and let us know what you are going to learn this new year. Stay tuned. There's more of the library show coming up after this. Please have a seat. I'll be honest. Your resume is not what I'm used to. I know. Okay, so what would you bring to my company? What do you need? I need a hard worker. Good. I've got two part-time jobs and to help my parents pay the bills. I need problem-solving skills. I got through high school without a car, a phone, or a computer. No college degree, though. Not yet, but... Life's taught me a lot, and I'm ready for more. Well, you're not the typical kind of candidate that I hire. But you are exactly what I'm looking for. Your company could be missing out on the candidates it needs most. Learn how to find, cultivate, and train a great pool of untapped talent at gradsoflife.org. South Cobb High School graduate and Cobb County native Ridwan Hassan was recently named a 2015 Rhodes Scholar. This extraordinary young man credits the Cobb County Public Library System for helping him prepare for his journey of changing the world. Let's meet Ridwan Hassan. Hello, my name is Ridwan Yassin Hassan. I am a senior at Dartmouth College and um, I'm here today because I was selected as a Rhodes Scholar. But beyond that, I was selected as Rhodes Scholar because of my community and because of the Cobb County Library System. And I say this because that I was awarded a Rhodes Scholarship, and this is a very prestigious award, but I did not do this by myself, and I could not have done it by myself. I, was, I got here today because when I, grew, when, I was, when I grew up, I relied upon the library system to educate me. I would read books constantly, and the, the library system fostered an academic curiosity in me that would not have ex existed if I w was not here when growing up. And beyond that, my community has played such a huge role in my life. And so I want to tell everyone else that th no matter what your adversity is, no matter what your circumstances is, you can succeed too. You can achieve any goal that you set out to, to achieve. And 
me personally, I grew up in a low-income community. I went to South Cobb High School. I went to these co these public schools that I valued so much, and I met so many peers and so many teachers who played such a key role in my life. So when I got to college, I was able to succeed and do well academically because I had such a strong foundation. The library gave me an avenue to experience so many different things in the world. I was able to read so many different books that and get so many different experiences I wouldn't have gotten without the library system. And because of that, my reading level was so, when I, I remember I went in third grade, people were telling me I was reading at a, a, fresh, a, high, school, a high school reading level. And I could not have done that was if it was not the library. I could not read these Harry Potter books, read these large texts and analyze them and actually critique, the, and critique them if I didn't have the library school system all throughout my way. Hello, my name is Victor Barrera. I'm a math teacher at South Cobb High School, and I'm one of the recommenders for Rick and her son's uh, scholar Rose scholarship. I'm Asana Sin. I'm a freshman at Dartmouth. Um, I'm Halima Hassan. I'm a, I'm a sophomore at Dartmouth. And hello, I'm Ridwan Hassan. I'm a senior at Dartmouth College, and I was just selected as one of 32 U.S. Rhodes Scholars. So to walk you through the process in June, around the summertime, I decided to apply for the scholarship. I, for a long time, I really didn't want to apply for the scholarship, and a lot of me wasn't into applying for the Rhodes. I had a lot of other things I wanted to apply for and go towards. I didn't really see the Rhodes scholarship as an opportunity that, you know, that I could achieve. But I talked to my teacher, Mr. Burrell, and I spoke to a lot of different students. And I talked, I remember I had a conversation with my friends, and I told her that you should apply for this scholarship. It's an amazing scholarship, and I feel that you would, and she went to my school, she went to South College, she went to Sanders, and I thought she would be a perfect match for the scholarship. But I, when I talked to a lot of people, they thought that the scholarship wasn't for us. They had the mentality that people from our community weren't Rhodes Scholars. So that really resonated with me as an individual, and I said, why can't we be Rhodes Scholars, you know? So even though I wasn't prepared years and years and years for the Rhodes Scholarships, like lots of my peers, I decided I'm going to apply for the scholarship and I'm going to do it for my community. You know, and I always tell the students that you are in control of your destiny. You know, you have adversity, you might come, you might be struggling, and all these different things might be helping you through your struggles. But at the end of the day, you have to use your adversity and your struggles to power you through college, to power you through high school, to power you through middle school. And that makes you a stronger person. And all my experiences and all my adversity has made me strong. And when I accepted that, when I accepted my background and my experiences and where I come from, I got, I got so much better in every facet of my life. Global, being a global citizen has always been a very important part of my existence in my life because I feel that you know being able to engage with my community and being able to engage with my college is, is great but I also need to engage with the globe on some level so after, in college I didn't have the opportunity to study abroad and I really wanted that experience so I set out to um, be a part of a humanitarian engineering initiative in a group but a lot of the groups that I wanted to join they built infrastructure for individuals in developing nations and when they built these infrastructures after a few weeks or a few months I ask them what happens when these, the well doesn't work, what happens when this infrastructure stops working or is malfunctioned? And they said, oh, then it doesn't work. And I said, well, wait, can't, you, know, you don't teach them how to fix it? They said, no, we, we build it for them. And that kind of struck me because I feel that individuals in these developing nations, they, a lot of them already have the intellectual capital. It already, I believe, it exists in those nations. And by one funding U.S. contractors or contractors from outside the country, we're not we're not growing their GDP. We're not growing their economy. So that's why we call the Global Development Project GDP because we're also wanting to grow the economies of these developing nations within their nations. And we partner with a lot of different schools. So right now we're partnering with Arboso Tech in Northern Somalia, and we're working with the headmaster, we're working with the students to build a project and initiative between the students at the school and the villagers to build a road because it's going to benefit not only the school but also the villagers. And I feel that this project can happen at a larger scale. And this, this grew out from my own passion and my, my own, sort of my desire to continue being a global citizen. So that's another thing that I was able to do from my trip from South Africa, because I think studying abroad changed my perspective on everything. It changed my perspective of how I saw my community, how I saw the world, and how I, how I saw myself as an individual. He is my mentor and not only my older brother. He tells me what I need to do and he shows me that anything is possible. And also one thing that he, that he told me that will always stay with me is help the ones who need help, not just the ones who want help. And that's definitely big because in our community, there's not always someone for everyone. 
So by going out and showing people that you can do this and by helping them out, even when they don't think it's possible and even when they don't want your help, if you're with them, that, that gives them a little bit of hope that I can do it too. My brother never once said that he wanted the scholarship for himself. He was always saying that this is something that would enrich the community and he would be a rep he would be a representation from the community rather than just being a beneficiary of a prestigious scholarship. So he was an inspiration to me. And also, um, when, when we picked him up at the airport, the first thing that I did was give him a huge hug, and I said, you did this. And what he said back to me was, no, we did this. And this shows that he, he, didn't, he did it not only for himself, but for everyone else, and it's showing everyone that it is possible. And by bringing it back and like talking to students, he's showing that anything is possible, as long as you try and work hard and find someone who will help you along the way. I'm gonna get emotional here too because <laughs> he's not just a teacher. He's not just a mentor. He's one of my best friends. And I honestly could not, if I didn't have that connection with Mr. Burrell, I don't know if I could constantly go back to my community, constantly feel that, you know, I, this has an impact. Because there are times as a mentor that it's tough and that you have all this, you know, personal, personal uh, adversity that you're going through. But at the same time, you have to constantly mentor and help these students. And sometimes I get, I, you know, I feel that this is a large weight on me. Should I keep doing it? And I look at Mr. Bro, and he's not only doing it, he's loving it. He's exuding it. And because of that, I'm, I'm honestly probably like the small, a small version of Mr. Bro. He is, he is the top. But I have, but I'm always, I've taught all three of these students here. So I'm always in the classroom talking about how they can achieve, although you're in the community, you can't accept that you always want more. And so I was telling my brother, we talked on the phone, I was like, I'm telling these kids these things because I want, I want them to do well. And I said, and these kids are actually believing me because it's a lot of, people talk about South Carolina, but we have so many students that are doing well in so many colleges. I mean, achieving so much and they're always Facebook. Facebooking me and telling me, giving me a mess, how they doing this and doing this. And I always call just to check on me. And I always tell, and I was telling Rick one last night, I always reply by, I'm doing wonderful because of the wonderful things you all are doing. And actually, when we, I'm, I'm the uh, sponsor for the National Honor Society. And so I built it. We have about, I want to say, we have about 95 National Honor Society students in my high school. Well, then we had a meeting, he came. And I told my students, and probably about 80% of those students I teach. And I saw, all the shows I tell you about successful student, what you can do, you have one right here. And he happened to be at the meeting. He spoke. I've talked to many people, and a lot of people have told me that becoming a World Scholar is an amazing award. But at the same time, it's a burden because now you have the responsibility to change your community, to change the world. And when I got the World Scholarship, the, one of the first things I thought about was my community. And I thought, you know, I, I thought that this is going to be. Great. I'm so happy to tell all my recommenders, to tell my full family, to tell everyone that will hear me that I, a South Cop student, became a Rhodes Scholar. Because, you know, as an individual, it's great that I was able to achieve at this level. But I was just so happy that now South Cobb is going to get this huge recognition and all the students can feed off this energy and do so much better. So, yes, it's a burden, but I honestly did not feel the burden because I've always felt the burden to constantly give back to community. When I got to college, I knew that there's so many other students who don't go to college, and I felt the burden to help students get into college. When I went to Dartmouth, there are so many students who don't attend Ivy League institutions, so I felt the burden to help students go to Ivy League institutions. And now that I'm a Rhodes Scholar, it's, it feels just like it did before. I've always had this responsibility for my community, because I have, my success was a determinant of all the factors that I had growing up, because of my teachers, because of my mentors, because of my parents. And because of that, I'm never leaving my community. I'm going to stay here forever, and I'm going to continue to mentor and motivate students to achieve at the high level, because I'm not the outlier. And I'm not going to say that I'm a brilliant or smart individual. I work hard, and I believe every student has the potential to do just that. Not only to become a world scholar, but maybe to even, to, they are, if not smart than me, just as smart as me. And they all have the potential to become road scholars, become martial scholars, to become the leaders of tomorrow. No one knows what the future holds for Ridwan, but we're all sure that he's bound for amazing things. Stay tuned, we'll be back with more of The Library Show.